All right, so for our first review topic, we're going to look at the properties of exponents, both integer and rational. Okay, so first of all, in general, what are our properties of exponents? Okay, they allow us a shorthand way of writing. So when I write something like this, for instance, the A is what I call the base, and the M and the N are the exponents. And because I'm multiplying two things that have the same base, I can actually combine these. Okay. Now, remember, exponents are a shorthand way of writing repeated multiplication. So this is saying M copies of A, all multiplied together, multiplied by N more copies of A. So in total, how many copies of A do I have? M plus N. So when multiplying two pieces with the same base, I can add their exponents. The second property deals with division instead of multiplication. And as might be expected, there is a pattern. As division and multiplication are essentially backwards of each other, on the right hand side, I'm going to do what is backwards of addition, which is subtraction. Okay. My third property is about what it means to be a negative exponent. And this actually is a consequence of property two. Okay. Notice in property two, the exponent that was in the denominator became negative when I combined it. So a negative exponent can be made positive by simply writing it in the bottom of a fraction. Alternately, if it's already in the bottom of the fraction and negative, by writing it in the top of the fraction, it becomes positive. Property four is that no matter what a is, with one exception, we'll get to that, anything to the zero is decreed to be one. Um, this is essentially what we have to have for all the other rules to always make sense. I said there was an exception. Note that zero to the zero is undefined. This is because normally zero to the anything is zero, and normally anything to the zero is one, and I cannot have something be both zero and one at the same time. This is undefined. All right, our next property, once again, we're back to multiplication, but this time I have two different bases. And what is very nice with this is that exponents interact very nicely with respect to multiplication. And essentially, I can just distribute the exponent because this was multiplication. Now, once again, multiplication and division are very similar. So if I have a division of two things raised to an exponent, I can also distribute the exponent to all pieces. Okay. My next property deals with more than one exponent. Okay, so inside the parentheses, it says I have m copies of a. Outside the parentheses, I said I take that and repeat it n times. So if I repeat m copies n times, what I actually end up with, excuse me, is m times n copies. Okay. Lastly, is how exponents, specifically a square, interact with absolute values. Um, since both absolute values and squares tend to get rid of negative signs, whether or not I put in absolute values is somewhat pretty much immaterial and they can be ignored. Now, I'm going to give you a warning. There are several warnings throughout this course and they are labeled that way because I've been teaching this class for a long time and I've noticed that students tend to make the same mistakes over and over again. So I'm hoping to avoid that for you by pointing out to you the most commonly made mistakes. Okay. Now, this warning is probably the most commonly made mistake in all of college algebra or pre-calculus, and not just at our school, but everywhere. In fact, it is such a common mistake that it has a fairly derogatory name called freshman exponentiation, the idea being that it is the mistake that all freshmen and college make. Okay. So remember that up here, when I had either multiplication or division raised to an exponent, the exponent distributed across the multiplication and division. The warning is that it does not work that way with addition or subtraction. Exponents do not behave well with addition and subtraction. 
there is literally nothing you can do to make this look prettier. Specifically, they absolutely do not equal what you would expect if you just distribute the exponent. Okay. As a very simple example, okay, consider 1 plus 3 squared. Okay. Now, order of operation says I should do the 1 plus 3 first, which is of course 4, and then squaring it give me 16. If I examine what would happen if I attempt to distribute the squared, this could give me 1 plus 9, which is of course 10, and these are most definitely not equal. So you absolutely cannot distribute an exponent across a plus or a minus sign. All right. So now we're going to do an example using all of these properties. And they can seem incredibly intimidating at first, but I like to call of these follow your nose problems. And I call them that because in my head I'm imagining a search dog who is sniffing along some trail of some criminal trying to find them. The dog does not know where they're going to end up. They do not know where the criminal is that they are chasing. Okay. What they know is where they should go next. They are standing in a spot. They smell, I should go that way. They go that way. Then once they're there, then they determine where to go next. That is what we are going to be able to be doing here. We do not know exactly what the final answer is going to look like. We do not know many features about it. All I can say is I can look at this and understand fairly quickly what I should do first. Now, order of operation still applies in that I should clean up the inside of the parentheses before ever worrying about the outside of the parentheses. Furthermore, you should combine like terms before worrying about anything else. So, combining like terms, well, I have the numerical portion, the 125 on top and the 25 on bottom, which divides to just give me 5. I have the x's, an x to the 12 on top, an x to the 8 on bottom. Okay. Using rule 2 tells me I should subtract the exponents. 12 minus 8 is 4. Looking at the y's, I have a y to the minus 14 on top and a y to the 6 on bottom. Again, I'm using rule 2, which means I should subtract. But be very careful when subtracting when negatives are involved. What I am doing here is negative 14 minus 6, which is negative 20. Then looking at the z's, I once again have the same thing. I need to subtract. Be careful, because what I have is 3 minus negative 2, which is in fact 5. Now, the instructions on these type of problems are usually simplified as much as possible. Uh, the understanding there is that you will have combined all like terms, which we have so far done, that you'll have gotten rid of all unnecessary parentheses, which I have yet to do. And furthermore, your final answer should never have negative exponents in it. However, I do not want to fix that negative 20 exponent right now because I still haven't finished messing with the exponents. So fixing the negative exponents is always the very last thing I do. So now that the inside is cleaned up a little bit, I'm going to turn my attention to the outside of the parentheses. This is going to be using rule five that says that every piece inside should have distributed to it the negative four exponent. Then using rule seven, I should combine these. Um, with the exception of the first one, which is a number, okay, five to the negative four is of course a decimal, and I don't like decimals. Decimals are evil because they encourage you to round, meaning not write the right answer. Okay, so instead I'm going to say, well, negative exponents are like, put a positive exponent on the bottom, and 5 to the 4th is 625, so I can write it like this. Alternately, if you do that in your calculator and get a decimal and do my favorite sequence of buttons on a TI graphing calculator, which is math, enter, enter, you'll get that answer too. All right, so now I'm going to be using rule 7, which says that I should multiply the exponents in each case. And now are you starting to understand why I encourage you to deal with negative exponents last? Because what was negative just changed. That is the last thing I have to do. So the only piece with a positive exponent will stay on top. 
the pieces with negative exponents will become positive exponents when I instead write them on the bottom. And now I have my final answer. All right. Next, we are going to look at what a fractional exponent means, meaning an exponent in the fraction. Wow, excuse me, a fraction in the exponent. Okay. So I have a fraction in my exponent here. There are two ways to think of this, depending on if you want to think of the numerator first or the denominator first. Most of the time people think of the numerator first, which is, so the numerator stays behind as the exponent. The denominator becomes a root, a square root, a cube root, a fifth root, so forth. But I could have done those in backwards order, which is take the root first and then take the exponent. You should get equivalent answers. So this means we can look at cleaning up things. Okay. So, here is an example. Again, my goal is to simplify. And square roots can be problematic. When square roots are in the problem, almost always it means your calculator cannot help you. Because if I, for instance, put the square root of 162 in a calculator, I will get a decimal answer. And no matter how many times you hit math, enter, enter, it will not give you a fraction because it is not a fraction. It is what's called an irrational number. So I have to do this without the calculator. And in actual fact, the number is the hardest part. Now, I still have the properties of exponents though, because according to this rule, roots are really exponents. So I have a multiplication inside an exponent. So the exponent can get distributed to each term. Okay, next I'm going to save the number for last because it's the hardest part. I'm going to now use this rule backwards. Okay, I have square roots here, which means this is going to become an x to the four halves. Instead of the square root, I'm writing an over two in the exponent and a d to the 12 halves. And of course, that becomes x squared d to the six. All right, so now I have to go back and fill in the number portion. So the first thing I'm going to do is hope that 162 is a perfect square. But if I type the square root of 162 into a calculator, it is unfortunately not a perfect square. So what do I do instead? I get the calculator out and I'm looking for the largest perfect square that cleanly divides 162. So I would start with, say, does 4 divide 162? It does not. Okay. Does 9 divide 162? It does. Okay. So this is where I'm going to start. Okay. 162 divided by 9 is 18. But then I pause and say, but 18, I know what it breaks into. It, there's another 9 here which means I could have done 162 divided by 81, or 9 squared, and gotten 2. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that 162, and I'm going to rewrite it as 81 times 2. Because 81 is a perfect square, its square root is 9. Square root of 2 is still square root of 2. Notice that I have moved it to the far right-hand side of the problem, I will always do that with problems that have square roots and not square roots. In other words, I'll always write the square root portion on the far right. And that is because there's not a clear ending point to a square root symbol. And this guarantees, since nothing is to the right of it, that I know exactly what is inside it. Whereas if I had written 9 squared to 2 x squared d to the 6, depending on how quickly I was writing and exactly where I ended that symbol, you might be confused if the x, for instance, was inside or outside of the square root. And we want to avoid that. So we will always put square roots on the far right. All right. Let's do another example. Ooh. 
Now this one has a plus in it. And again, as roots are really exponents, and we know exponents don't really interact very well with pluses and minuses, this problem is going to be annoying. But what I do have is what I always have, which is that you can combine like terms. But right now they don't look very like, because one has a square root of two and one has a square root of 32. So I'm gonna look at this square root of 32. It is unfortunately not a perfect square, but it is divisible by a perfect square. Specifically, 32 is 16 times two. So then, square root of 16 is four, Square root of 2 is, of course, still square root of 2. Okay. Notice, because 3 was multiplied by the square root of 16, I still have 3 times 4, which is, of course, 12. At this point, I say, yay, they look alike. I can combine them. So I have five copies of this mysterious square root of 2 plus 12 more copies of the same thing. Gives me 17 copies of the square root of 2. All right. The last thing I'm going to mention is something that, I'm going to be honest with you, I think is redundant now because we do a lot less things by hand in math these days, but it is something you at least need to be aware of how to do um, in the event that you need it, which when we get towards the trigonometry unit, you do actually need it occasionally. And it is called rationalizing the denominator. So I said I think that it's ridiculous that we still push this. That is because the reason we did it is, for instance, if I had this, people didn't like it because a square root in the bottom means you had no intuition about what this was. Square root of two is approximately 1.4. One divided by 1.4, I can't really do in my head. I have no idea what this is. Rationalizing this denominator turns into to square root of two over two which looks more complicated, but is something I can more easily understand in my head. Again, square root of two is about 1.4. 1.4 divided by two makes this about 0.7. Okay. And I can do that essentially easily in my head or with pencil and paper. Now, since no one does these kinds of things in their head anymore, they use calculators, I'm totally okay if your answers look like this, unless you are specifically told to rationalize the denominator. So, Let's just do a little bit of practice. So how do I rationalize a denominator? I multi So there's two different versions. The first version is when the square root is alone in the denominator. And by alone, I mean nothing is added or subtracted to it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply top and bottom of the fraction by the square root. I'm allowed to do that because square root of 3 over square root of 3 is just 1. And I can multiply anything I want by 1 without materially changing it. So now, 7 times root 3 is exactly that. Root 3 times root 3 is 3. And I have gotten rid of the, the, the square root in the denominator. Now it is a little bit more complicated when the square root is not alone in the denominator. That is when something is added or subtracted to it. I'm still going to multiply top and bottom by the same thing so that I'm essentially multiplying by 1. But what I'm going to multiply by is something a little bit different. It is called the conjugate of the denominator, and it is change the sign in the middle. So since my problem had a minus sign, I wrote a plus sign. If I had a plus sign in my original problem, I'd multiply by a minus sign version. So what do I have? 3 times 1 plus square root of 2. Notice I am not multiplying out the top. On the bottom, I have these two terms that get multiplied. I am going to multiply these out, which means I will FOIL them. So I get 1 plus root 2 minus root 2 minus root 2 times root 2 is 2. And those root 2s canceled. So then what do I have in the bottom? 1 minus 2 is negative 1. And there's no reason to divide by negative 1 because it's the same as multiplying by negative 1. And there is my final answer, and no square roots in the denominator.